Good morning. It's good to see you here today. I hope you're doing well. If you're watching the video, we're glad that you're tuning in with our YouTube channel. Um, it is good to be here in the house of the Lord. Um, it's a beautiful day. Um, I think we're going to have some beautiful days, and, and El Nino is coming, I think is what they said. So we're going to have warm, maybe wetter winter. We'll see how that goes. Those that like cold weather may be bummed out by that. Those that you hate cold weather, you're like, yay, you know. Um, but uh, we've got pretty weather now, and it's, it's, it, it's nice. So um, just a couple of things. Today we'll have a council meeting right after the service. Um, I want to hand you the information for the charge conference, which will be November the 3rd at 5 o'clock. Um, kind of go over that, make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, also, just want to kind of get ready for that. The signature page, we need to make sure everybody is present who needs to sign because this year we cannot sign the form until after charge conference is over. So um, please stay right after service right here in the sanctuary. We'll have a short meeting and then we'll be done. Um, thank you for doing that and being a part of that. Um, inside your bulletin over the upcoming events, you'll see the different things coming up. I uh, want to talk about the trunk or treat, which will be this Wednesday. Please make note that because of the trunk or treat, um, we will not be having Wednesday night supper. Um, you just come, bring your trunk, and we'll have candy for that, and just have a good time between the two churches as we normally do. Um, that's always a big event for our community. They'll close up the 4th Street, and uh, we'll just have a good time together. Um, if you have any questions about that stuff, you can see Holly Ann right after the service, um, and she can help if, if, if you have any questions about that. Um, but I think the insert is pretty self-explanatory. Um, please just fill that out and turn that in. Um, and then next Sunday is our 150th anniversary. Um, so excited about that. We've, I don't know if you saw the peanut wagon as you came into town. Um, right there is a big sign that kind of announces that. Uh, Marcus Tri Tripp, a former pastor, is going to be here to share the message that day. We'll have one service that day. Uh, we do want to meet at 930 um, right outside by the bell tower. Um, which is it's not a tower, it's a bell station, basically. And we're going to ring the bell to announce Sunday school class for all of us. And um, hopefully the sign will be up, and maybe at that time we can dedicate the sign as well uh, before Sunday school starts. So um, we can meet out there about 10 minutes till uh, 9.30 and try to do that. I think that'll be a good thing. Uh, the bell tower's been redone. It looks nice. The sign has been redone, and hopefully they'll get that finished this week. Um, and we can dedicate those two things. I'm excited about next Sunday. I hope you invite people. Come be a part of our time uh, as we celebrate what God has done in 150 years here at our church. It's also the community's 150th uh, birthday. And so uh, Saturday, they're going to have a big thing over there um, in front of the courthouse celebrating the birthday of Leesburg. And so we're going to have a great weekend. I hope that you'll be a part of all the different events that are taking place. Um, if you have any questions about that, please let us know. All right, let's stand now and invite God to be a part of our time together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come together, we just thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for this time that we can come to worship you. We just pray that you'd speak to our hearts and lives. Lord, allow us to feel your presence very real and fresh. We're here for a lot of different reasons, God, but I don't think we're here by accident or chance. Lord, let us leave this place knowing we've been with you. May all we do and may all we say in these moments bring glory and honor to your name. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. We've got a video to show at this time. <laughs> Hey, Judy, um, thanks for doing this. And could you tell me about some of your early memories of the church? Well, one memory I can, I can remember was Diane May, who some of people may remember, Colonel May and his wife, Elsie May. She was a registered nurse. But anyway, in, in, I guess in Sunday school, we had this thing of attendance that you were rewarded every year for if, how many times you came to Sunday school and if you didn't miss it. Well, Diane, which was my age, had not missed Sunday school for like five years. I mean, it, she was steady. Well, one time she got sick or had something that she couldn't come, 
but her mother, so she wouldn't break the record, drove her car up to the back of the church, right by the Sunday school room. We pushed the window up so she could hear the Sunday school lesson and not get miss the class. Oh, uh, that is great. Uh, we heard some of Neil Wingfield's memories about Vacation Bible School. Can you tell me some of your memories about Vacation Bible School? Well, Vacation Bible School was always something I looked forward to because kind of different from the way it is now. It was all day or maybe from 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock, but we ate lunch over there. And also we did field trips. But it, And then Friday night was the big show. And that was something we practiced all week, just like they do now. But it was a production. And I, I just remember the, son, the teachers really put a lot into it. We did crafts, we did, I mean, it was just everything. It was something that I always will remember. And you got to know more about Jesus. Amen to that. So uh, you grew up right next door to the church. Right, so, so I walked to church. And I you've been coming your drive. whole life. Right, exactly. exactly. And so what was the church like when you first started coming? What do you remember? Well, the one thing I remember, it was Sunday. And Sunday was a day that you went to church and Sunday was a day that you got dressed up and went to church. And it was just a real day, it was a special day. And you didn't do anything else after church. I mean, you didn't go to Albany and go shopping or you stayed here. It was a Sabbath day and you honored that. And you had the big Sunday meal on Sunday. And it was just a special day. Yeah. And the big Sunday nap, I hope. Oh, well, I don't know. I think I'm quite, but, but Mother didn't let, I mean, she couldn't do anything like work. Right. You know, no housework, no yard work, no nothing like that. It was Ooh, a Sabbath. Right. Well, thank you, Judy. Those of you that don't know, Judy Powell, who should, she's part of every single thing that takes place in the city of Leesburg, um, but she goes to our early service, and Judy is probably one of the longest members of our church. Um, I won't say the oldest, but she's been a member of this church since birth, like she said, and, and lived right across the way from the church, and always has, she knew, remembered pastors long ways back, so um, we, we are just excited about this. Uh, next week, we'll have another video of a longtime member, um, and I just hope that you'll come again, invite folks to be a part of a special uh, service where we celebrate 150 years together. All right, Miss Carlin, you want to come and lead us in our service? Good morning. All right. Our uh, first hymn is To God Be the Glory, page 531, or it's on the screen. Got lots to give him all the glory about. To God be the glory.
seated. As we go now for a time of prayer, please remember on your bookmark that you have in your order of worship, um, you can put down any need that you might have and turn that in. If it's unspoken, check the box. Um, I do want to add um, the family of Charles Houston. Uh, Reverend Charles Houston uh, was a longtime pastor in the United Methodist Church. He served in Plains and Preston. I got to know him in Douglas. He was a good friend of the pastor at the time and uh, got to know him a little bit more when I was over there. Um, he was a, a chaplain for the Department of Natural Resources and was over at Sapelo Island um, yesterday when the, uh, the gangplank gave way, and he was one of the ones that was killed. Um, seven of them died. Twenty people went into the water that they know of. Um, just a tragic accident. He was there celebrating uh, a, a kind of a festival for um, slavery, those folks that were slavery and honoring them. Um, so it was kind of a, a, a missional thing he was doing um, when it happened. And so, um, again, he just had a big heart, was a, a big, tall guy. You looked up to him, um, had a heart for uh, servicemen, uh, was a chaplain for the police department, county department, just did so much, and just a tragedy. And so um, please keep um, his family. I think he has two daughters in, in, or a daughter and a son. I can't remember, but... I know he has children and grandchildren, so please keep them in your prayers if you will. We also want to remember um, Albert and Loretta's grandson, Augie. Um, they thought maybe his shunt was messing up again. We all remember uh, he was premature and had, uh, had to have a shunt when he was born. and um, He started having a bad headache yesterday at the Berg Bash. and um, That uh, ended up not, I don't think they, th they think the shunt's fine. I think he was just having a headache, but they did want to check to make sure he didn't have a seizure. And so they've had a very long night, and, uh, and they're uh, trying to get over from that. And if you will, keep my son Ben in your prayers. He's had the flu and has been sick since Tuesday. Um, and last night was just a rough night again. And uh, uh, Krista's home with him. And Micah, we didn't get a lot of sleep either. So I um, just want to pray for that as well. And then a, a, a honor, a blessing I want to lift up is our band had a competition yesterday, and they got um, straight superiors and actually got third out of 22 <coughs> bands. So that's pretty powerful. Yeah, that's a big thing. And so um, Sean is on that band. We have some others, but he's not here because he's sleeping. So we understand he's worn out, but we did want to honor that. That's a big deal, and so um, we're thankful for that. Um, so... Again, you have any need, please fill that out and let us be praying for that need. Um, let's have a moment of silence as we gather our thoughts and I'll lead us in our morning prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we certainly give you all the glory and honor and praise because you alone deserve it. You are almighty, omnipotent, and you've set the stars in the skies and the heavens. And Lord, it just blows me away. I go out at night and see the heavens and just think about your hands and what you've done. And I'm blown away that you are mindful of us. In fact, you know us inside and out. You know our struggles. You know our pains, our hurts. You know those concerns we have and the people that are in a part of those concerns. Lord, you know our a depression, you know our um, fear, you know our sorrow. Lord, you know us inside and out. There's nothing that we can hide from you. And Lord, I'm thankful for that truth today. You forgive us, you set us straight, you mark our paths, and you walk with us all along this life's way. I'm thankful for your kindness, your forgiveness, your love that never leaves us or forsakes us. Lord, today we come before your throne. And we lift up all these names we've just mentioned. Specifically, Lord, I just pray for Charles Houston's family. A pastor in the middle of doing something that pastors do, and he lost his life. But I'm thankful that he didn't lose anything, and neither did his family, because he is safe in your arms today. I believe that with all my heart. I just pray you cover them and be with them through this time of sadness and death, Lord. Lord, I do pray for those that are sick. I pray for little Augie. pray for Ben. And all those that we've not mentioned this morning that we name in our hearts today. I just pray, God, that you would be the great physician. Bring healing where healing is needed. Uh, direction in medicine where, where that is needed. Um, I know we've got so many different folks who are waiting on test results. And, and we just pray, God, that those results would come back negative. 
but with direction. Lord, I'm thankful for this church that we're a part of, this family of faith. It's proud. I'm proud, Lord, that for 150 years this church has existed. This church has been a beacon of hope and light. Sometimes we may not have done things the way we should have. Sometimes we could have done them better. But God, we're still here and we're still doing your will, I believe. And we want you to direct our path still today. Lord, as we think about the ministries of this church, we ask that you'd go before us. Whether it's the trunk or treat, whether it's the 150th um, birthday party we have, we want all these things to honor you and to impact the world around us in which we live. Lord, we want to be those places that bring people to your kingdom. Help us, Lord, and, and we know there's still much to do. So if there be anything else you'd have us to be a part of in ministry, open those doors so that we can be a part of them. Lord, in this political season we find ourselves in, election has started here in Georgia, uh, voting has started here in Georgia, and we just pray, God, that uh, you would give us wisdom as we vote. Uh, help us to vote our conscience. And Lord, when we're done voting, help us to leave it with you. And remind us that no matter who we vote for or who we think should be, if our person doesn't get it or the other party does, remind us that they're not the ones in control. Ours is not in the ones in control. You are in control. And we can trust you. We love you today, Father. Again, we're thankful for this time that we can come together. I just pray blessings on all of us gathered here. And that, again, we would hear you speak to our hearts very clearly. Your presence is welcomed here, Father. In fact, we need it. So we love you, God. Thank you for the blessings in our lives. And we give you all the praise and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, our next hymn is going to be Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And uh, I was thinking in early church when I heard about um, Charles is it Houston or Houston uh, killed. I think I know him. And you think about a man that's kind of, you know, just done ministry all his life and you know and then to die tragically like that and then we were talking about you know little children sick and Ben and little Augie and when I look out here I, I know a lot of y'all have been through all kind of things I mean you know sad sad things and tragic things but and I was thinking what what in the world would we do without the Lord I mean how how could you make it and, and most of you that have been through that have said we we, we wouldn't have so we're going to sing about that, leaning on those everlasting arms. They're right there. You know, he's waiting on us. So let's just stand, and we'll sing these three verses. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, Stay. 
Heavenly Father, we are leaning on your everlasting arms, and what a blessing it is to know that they're there for us to lean on. Lord, we have so many blessings in our lives. I pray that we would see that very clearly. Take these gifts, these offerings we give to you now. Use them for your kingdom's work. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You be seated. You can remain standing and sing along. It's not just a story, it's a living, breathing, walking testimony of a God so good he leave his home in glory for the world he loves, for the world that he so loves. It's not just a story, I believe in the life of Jesus. can't deny it if I said I got here on my own I'd be lying
Amen. Let's pray. Before you sit, let's pray. Lord God, we do believe it. I pray the heartbeat of what we just sang is true for all of us. It's not just a story. It's truth. It's reality for us. And it impacts everything we do. The heart of what we just sang is true for every heartbeat that we live in this life. We believe it. And we believe you are who you say you are. As we come to your word now, Lord, open it up to our hearts. May we feel your presence in your word now. In your name, amen. You may be seated. The kids can go with Holly in now for Connect. If y'all didn't get it, in the back, there's a sheet that you get on your way out that's got all the verses that I'm going to be looking at. I know a lot of you try to write them down real quick. Um, so somebody made the mention, and so I said, I'll, I'll put them on a sheet so you have them. Um, our passage today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and we're going to be looking at verses 36 through 49. So <clears throat> we've talked a lot about marks of discipleship. And this is not an exhaustive list that we've looked through, but I think the ones we've looked through have kind of led us uh, to this kind of moment. And it's kind of a moment where we started. Um, when I started, we talked about putting on our kingdom glasses so that everything we see, everything we do, it goes through you. Whether that's a funeral or whether that's a wedding. And consequently, y'all be keeping Carly and Travis in your prayers. Carly's going to be getting married this afternoon um, in uh, Perry, and uh, I'm going to be going to do that wedding, and I think many of you are going to be going to that wedding. So just keep them both in your prayers. That's Sydney's daughter, Sean Nick's daughter, and we just want to keep them in our prayers. But we put on our kingdom glasses, whether it's a wedding, a new beginning, or whether it's a funeral, seemingly the end of this life, but a new beginning in the next, right? And so everything we see from point A to point B, birth to death, is this, this idea that I'm putting on my glasses so all I can see is Jesus. I have a pair of glasses that are prescription and they're strictly for up close. And so when I put those on and look out, I can't see any of your faces. And so this morning I had them at the early service and I put them on and all I could see was smudges. And I was like, man, I can't see nothing. You know, it's, it reminds me of my son, Michael, when he was little, he'd always have smudges on his glasses. He'd say, I can't see these glasses. 
glasses aren't working. Say, let me hold them. And I do this, and he said, oh, man, that's better. You know, because he had fingerprints. As a kid, you put fingerprints all over your glasses. But those smudges reminded me that I saw the smudges. And so if I put Jesus in my glasses, then everything I see filters through him. So if you wear glasses, this is kind of a good image for us. If you have reading glasses, you put on your reading glasses so that you can read. I want us to put on our kingdom glasses so we see Jesus in everything that we do. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, he's there. Um, From work to family to whatever, um, Jesus is present. And so we're going to kind of end at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, 36 through 49. And this is the kind of the end of Jesus um, physically with his disciples. So let's read it together. Luke 24, 36 through 49. It's up there. You can turn to it in your Bible. And I'm going to be reading it um, through uh, my, my paper here, but I've got my Bible open to it. While they were t- telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do you doubt? Why are doubts arising in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it. Before them. Now let's stop right there. So, our disciples are locked in a room with fear and doubt. Now, those of you who've been a part of the Chosen series, we've been paying attention to, or maybe you've watched it at home, if there's anything that the Chosen series has done well, it's showed us this powerful connection that Jesus has with his disciples. He was with them for three years nonstop, every day, with them, doing ministry, doing life, growing a connection, and loving them as if they were his sons. Deep brothers, some kind of close connection. Now, there are times in this life when we don't agree with one another. There are times in this life when we see things differently But if we are connected, if we are truly brothers and sisters, then the love we have for one another does not diminish because we're on different pages. I want you to understand Jesus' disciples struggled to understand who he was. And I think that's a huge part of some of the frustration he held. Because he told them over and over again who he was, what was going to happen, and they just didn't get it. We see that in the chosen very well. And I think it is a struggle for Jesus. And and struggling is not a sin, right? And so Jesus is human. And he's struggling because they're not getting it. But can I tell you there are times that we don't get it? There are times we struggle through it. We don't understand. We're, We're not quite understanding why it's happening. So listen, Jesus has just been executed on a cross, Right? John was there. John saw it. John saw the spear going in his side. He gave report to the others. He's dead, y'all. They took his body off the cross. They put him in a grave. They rolled a stone away. This man that we followed, who was betrayed by our brother Judas, Judas is dead. He hung himself. This man we loved, who was with us for three years, he's gone too. All this is so big, and it's so hard, and it's so confusing. And they are sitting in this lock room, afraid, not knowing what to do next. Was it the three years of our life, was it a waste? What do we do? Have you ever been there? Have you ever locked yourself in a room? Because of fear, because of doubt? Friends, I don't know about you, but I've done that many times in my life. I don't understand why things are happening the way they're happening. I don't understand why we have to go through this. I don't understand why Charles Houston had to be on a bridge doing ministry when it collapsed and seven people lost their life at that moment. I don't get it. But I don't have to. I have to trust the one who's seen Charles Houston through every part of his life. I have to trust the one who's seen me through every aspect of my life. 
So a mark of a disciple that I understand and I hope you understand in your life is that he is a comforter, right? Did you read what we just read? So these men are locked in the room. Can I tell you lock rooms don't keep Jesus out? Can you say amen to that? Locked rooms do not keep Jesus out. Depression, listen, it's not going to keep Jesus out. Thoughts of, uh, uh, that are not pure thoughts, it's not going to keep Jesus out. Sin is not going to keep Jesus out. Nothing can keep Jesus out. Nothing. So they lock the door, they hide away, he comes in. And Jesus does and gets right to the point where their comfort is. Now, the word comfort here is not like, I want to be comfortable, right? Can you put a pillow behind my back? I want to be. That's not the comfort we're talking about. No, the comfort we're talking about is, is a deeper comfort. It's a comfort that is important for us to understand. Comfort is designed by it to ease grief, distress, or loss. Listen to some of these passages that we have on comfort. Isaiah 41, comfort, oh comfort my people, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which is we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in suffering too. Comfort, friends. Jesus comes into that room and he speaks truth into their life. They think he's a ghost. Now this was a very superstitious time. And they saw ghosts and evil spirits in so many different things. Whether it's the storm on the Sea of Galilee or other places, and so they think, uh-oh, a ghost is here. And Jesus speaks to this nonsense. He shows them his hands and his feet and his side. And he says, touch it and see. But they still are afraid. They still don't believe. And so as if to say, listen, give me something to eat. Do ghosts eat? I've never seen anything where ghosts eat. Have you? I've never seen a ghost either. But all the movies I've watched, they don't eat. So, so he gives, they give him a piece of fish and he eats it. Jesus takes away the fear. Jesus shows them that he is who he is. Can I tell you that he knows your fear, your doubts, your struggles? He knows them. And he comes right into that locked place needs that you might have in that moment. Listen, the Bible is clear. God wants to be your source of comfort. But did you read the passage we just, did you hear the passage we just read in Corinthians? He wants to because he wants you to be a source of comfort for others. There are people that are putting their arms around those families that have lost loved ones in that horrific accident. My little boy Ben has been really sick. And this morning he kind of had a panic attack because he was having a hard time. He was coughing and, and he was laying down. And so I picked him up and I held him close. And I said, just breathe, son. Just breathe. It's okay. I've got you. And he said, I think I'm going to th throw up on me. It's okay. You're okay. I've got you. And his little heart started calming down. And I got him to calm down. And I sat him down. And he began to calm down. Can you picture God picking you up and saying, calm down. I've got you. I got you. It's okay. Whatever it is that we go through, in my lifetime, I have felt that exact feeling. And I want you to understand he's there with open arms ready to comfort you through whatever it is you're struggling with. He's there to hold you in the midst of your 
sadness. He's there to assure you in the midst of your fear. He's there to forgive you in the midst of your addiction. He's there to heal you in the midst of your sin. Whatever it is, he's there with arms open wide, holding, ready. So let's continue on in our passage. He gives us comfort. Verse 44. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, this is it written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem and on. So let's stop right there. So he gives them comfort and the need and their time of comfort. But then we see he gives them clarity. Clarity is the quality of being easy to see or hear, sharpness of image or sound. Clarity. Aren't you glad that God gives us clarity? There are times we're in these locked rooms and, and he shows up. What he has been saying to them the whole time, they have not gotten. And now he recites the word again and he says, remember that the Son of Man had to be taken up and die and then on the third day rose from the dead. I'm here. This is me. And then in that moment, what he had said the whole time, the word of God that they had, the Old Testament, it came alive to them. And they got it. And this was the moment where the disciples understood exactly the course of their lives. Now they weren't 100% really on board yet. The Holy Spirit was going to come. And the clarity would be even more. But in the midst of our moments when God gives us that comfort, He also brings clarity. Have you ever been there where clarity comes? And you're like, man, I see now. Or maybe his word. Maybe when you first became a Christian, you were having a hard time understanding it. But now as you read it, it pops up and it, and it, and it enlightens and, and you get it. Do you know why? Because the Holy Spirit gives us clarity. This is what we need as we start to think about the calling in our life. He gives us clarity. I want to give us some passages that we can look at for clarity. There's a bunch. Psalm 119, one. Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Matthew 7, 5, this is a hard saying, but true. You hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly. Take the speck out of your brother's eye. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then finally, there's others you can read, but the one I want to lift up, Ephesians 1, 17 through 18. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. God gives us clarity. Marks the disciples. We are those who understand what it means to be comforted. And when turned, we give comfort. But friends, we are also those who have been given a clarity of his word and purpose. This calling in our lives. We have put on our kingdom glasses. And I can see clearly for the first time. You see, this really is a transformation of life. No longer do I see through the world's lenses. Now I see through him. And everything I do, I understand I'm not there by chance. I'm not there by accident. I'm there for the divine purpose of him in my life. That is the clarity of the kingdom. And if there's anything that Jesus gives his disciples in this moment, it's a clarity that begins to stir. Because after this, we see a purpose in their lives, and it is straight as a tack. And they are going to where God is calling them to go. 
Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I want that clarity. I have been walking around. I've been doing my own thing. I've been living my life, punching a clock, nine to five. You know, just get home and, and just want to make it through another day. I saw a, a, a post and it said, I never knew old age would get here so fast. That's an amen, right? Every day, though, if we, if we start with a purpose, I wonder if, if old age takes a little bit longer because our purpose is clear. And, and if our clarity is there, then we understand what awaits us at the end of the day, at the end of our lives. Today, are you praying for a clarity of purpose? clarity of his word to come alive for you because of our final point let's finish up our passage verse 48 and 9 let's go back to 47 and that repentance from forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from jerusalem you are witnesses of these things and behold i am sending forth the promise of my father upon you but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. And he led them out, verse 50 says, and blessed them. Can I tell you that the bishop laid his hand on my head and he said, I commission you to be an elder in the church, to take up the sacraments, and to preach the word of God. I will never forget that moment in my life. But can I tell you today, I was commissioned, but I'm not the only one who's been commissioned. When you accepted Jesus Christ, when I accepted Jesus Christ, I was also commissioned at a young age. And so have you been. Every single one of you. Remember? We did the Great Commission the first time, the first sermon we started on this series. The commission to go out, make disciples of all men. This is it. This is the moment we've come back to. Commissioned is a group of people officially charged an assignment or a job. You have been commissioned, church. Make no mistake about it. But can I tell you, when we're locked in a room, if those disciples would have stayed up in that room, do you think you and I would be here today? Probably not. But you see, God comes to comfort them. Then he gives them clarity. And then he gives them the commission. Now, some of us today need to obey what he says at the commission. Wait until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Can I tell you, I believe all of us have the Holy Spirit in us because I don't believe you can be saved without it. But I do believe that there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, a moment where the Holy Spirit is given freedom to do what it needs to do within our lives. And I think some of us need to let go of the door that locks the Holy Spirit. We need to start being, stop being afraid of what it's doing. We need to stop worrying about what it's going to ask me to do. We need to let it go and let the Spirit do what it's going to do because it is the power. You know, when I watch the Georgia Bulldogs play, I turn the radio on and I turn my, ra my TV to silent. And my radio is about 55 seconds ahead of the TV. And so I know what's happening before I see it on the TV. So I'm either going, man, this is terrible, or I'm going, whoa, I know what's going to happen. It's great. I can call my buddies up and say, did you see that play? They said, no. Well, let me tell you. I don't do that, but, but I can if I want to. But you know that radio, I, at first I had this little handheld radio. And at my house, for some reason, the channel the dogs are on does not come through. And when it does, it's like, and John, and it does, so you don't get the whole story. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I have to wait for the TV to show me what happened. So I got, Micah said, Dad, you can have my radio because it's digital. I said, awesome. But then he said, I've lost the cord. I was like, great. What good is this without a cord? I mean, so then I was like, oh, but it's got batteries. 
So I had to put eight of those big honking batteries in the bottom of that thing, which was pretty expensive, but I did it, so that I could listen to the dogs play. And that was the power. And now I could sit there and get mad or sad, wait before the TV shows me what happens. But without those batteries, it's worthless. You have the batteries that never go dry. You don't have to change them. It's in there, plugged in, ready. The power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, wait until the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. Listen, some of us need to wait and open up the Holy Spirit move. You got clarity, you want to be comforted, great. He does that to open up the Spirit so that you can be commissioned and do what He's called you to do. Because some of you are strategic places, not by chance, not by accident. Whether that's the college you're at, whether that's the sorority, the fraternity you're at, whether that's the high school, the middle school you're at, whether that's the job over here, whether that's the nurse, the teacher, wherever you are, you're not there by chance, you're not there by accident, you have been commissioned to be where you are to make a difference in somebody's life for the kingdom of God. You are a disciple of the living God. He is alive, he is well, and he is working the power of the Holy Spirit in you and me. If that don't get you fired up, I don't know what will. So listen to the Holy Spirit. Understand that job that seems like drudgery. You're not there by accident. And friends, you may not be there forever, but he's got you there for now. Wherever you are, how are you making a difference? If you're just doing the status quo, just trying to make it through the day, that ain't going to cut it. And that's not what he wants for you. He wants you to be a light. He wants you to shine. He wants you to make a difference for his kingdom where you are. You have been commissioned for a time such as this. Friends, we are disciples. And we have been put on with the armor of God, the hand of God. The movement of God. Remember last week, if we are silent, nature will cry out. But why in the world would we be silent? Why? When we have a God that has done so much. Amen? So, as the praise team comes, in our final song, I will follow So for some of us, we're still locked in the room. And you think you're safe in that locked room from anything coming and getting you. But can I tell you, you're not safe from the Spirit of God moving in that place because he comes through locked doors. So maybe you just need to let him on in and give you the comfort that you need, the healing that you need, the forgiveness that you need, the restoration that you need and let him move you to a place of clarity so maybe some of you are in a place of clarity and you say I know what I need to do I know where God has put me but I don't know what I need to do I, I don't get it you, it could be as simply as something as Miss Ruckel saying will you come and do the devotion at WizKids can I tell you, that's a commissioned spot. That's a moment. And my two were able to do that last year. And we've got two more of our youth doing it this year. That is a commission. That is a place. These young people are sharing the good news to these kids in our community who are there at WizKids. Or it could be, hey, there's this person you work with. And, and I have put you in a strategic place so that you can comfort them, share the good news with them, because I've got something for them to do, and you're going to be the one to share it with them. I don't, I don't know, but I know he wants to. So whether you're locked up, comes in and gives you that comfort, or, or he gives you that clarity, or maybe you've given clarity, and it's time to move. This song speaks to the idea, are you going to follow him? I will follow. Is that the heartbeat of who you are? As we
get ready for worship, I pray that it is. And that this altar is open for you to come if you need to speak to him about anything. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come now, I pray that you would speak to us in this moment. That your word would come alive. And that we would see clearly who you are. If we need comfort, God, you are there with arms open wide to give us that comfort. If we need clarity, your spirit opens your word to us. And you give us that clarity of purpose and mission and calling. If it is commissioned, you have commissioned all of us. Lord, give us a clarity of what that looks like, where you have put us in this moment. Lord, speak to our hearts and lives. And maybe, Lord, there are those here today that have never given their life to you. And they would say, you know, I don't know that I'm even a disciple. Maybe this would be the moment that they would give their life completely to you, surrendered so that they can be called a disciple and follow after you and what we've talked about for the last six weeks. I don't know, Lord, but I know you have a purpose for all of us. Speak to us now in this moment. In your precious name, amen. Stand and join us. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in Follow him. 
You have been commissioned. Hear me today. Just as the bishop put his hands on my head, I believe the Holy Spirit has put his hands on all of our heads. And he has said, go into the world and make disciples of all men. Friends, that is our job. That is our commission. We do it where he's placed us. And I think he's placed all of you in a family, in a place, in a mission, in a community. He's put you in a place. Not by chance. Not by accident. Let him comfort you. Let him give you clarity and step into the commissioning that he's given us all. Amen? Next week, 150 years, this church has existed with this commission. That's a long time, church. Now, again, we haven't done things perfect, but we're still here. And if God tarries, which I don't think he will, but if he does in 150 more years, I don't think any of us will be here. But I hope this church is still doing the things it need to be doing. Amen? Let's pray. God, as we close out our time together, we love you. We thank you for the commission in our lives. Help us to receive that comfort that you have for us in the midst of whatever it is we go through that keeps us from following into that commission. Help us to get that clarity that is ours through your spirit that opens your word alive, that, that allows us to hear you speak clearly in our lives. And may we do what you're calling us to do, that great commission that you've given every single one of us. We're ready, Father. We will follow in your name. Amen. Don't forget, we're having a short council meeting right up here, right now. So if you can do that. Who you?